start with a disclaimer, a, a timely disclaimer. Um, in 1978, uh, I was training to run the Boston Marathon. And what that meant was uh, we had a, our class schedule at the time, I was a second year medical student, our class schedule was such that we were off from 11 a.m. when we finished in what class, and 1 p.m. when we uh, had our immunology class. So my friend John Foster and I would go for a run of varying length starting at you know, five, six miles in January and extending up to close to 15 miles uh, as the day of the marathon got closer and closer. Um, we would then grab a quick lunch and proceed to immunology class. And you can guess what I did for the entire three months period uh, in my immunology class. I slept quite soundly through it. Mm -hmm. um, so while I didn't, contrary to popular did not fail, of course. Um, in fact, I was accused of cheating on the exam by a Nobel laureate, the new uh, Baroud Benassarov. Um, but a quick review of my scores, um, they realized that I couldn't possibly have been cheating and done as poorly as I did. Um, so <laughs> with that, with that um, introduction, we'll start with human immunity, not um, not because the details are important, but to, to get the general concept of immunity so that when we think about bacterial immunity, there's, there's some sort of context for it. So in, in humans, there are sort of three main components to the, to the immune system. And the first one, broadly speaking, are T cells. The second are the B cells. And the third is the lymph node. And we're, we're talking gross uh, misrepresentations and oversimplifications of how, how the immune system works. But as a first approximation, you have a repertoire of T cells that have on their surface the so-called cell receptor that recognizes antigens, okay? And we have a enormous repertoire of antigens that can be recognized because the T cell receptor um, has its genome organized in such a way that here's the promoter of the gene you have a constant region, you'll have a variable region, and you'll have a, um, a hypervariable region. And this piece is involved in, a, in the formation of the intracellular and signaling portion of the T cell receptor. Variable and hypervariable regions are composed of an entire array of highly variable or restrained but variable sequences and even less restrained sequences. And during the course of development of a T cell, what happens is you get a splicing of this piece to this piece and lose this, lose the rest of this to provide a single T cell receptor. And likewise, you'll have these numerous combinations of variable and hypervariable regions. It gives you this enormous array of, of antigens that can be recognized. When an antigen is recognized, there um, are signals that tell, in the right context, this cell to proliferate so that um, this antigen can be recognized not just by a single cell or a small number of cells, but by much larger number of cells, and that then uh, 
does a couple of things. One, depending on the antigen, can respond directly, and there are subsets of T cells that are responsible for, for so-called cellular immunity, killing viruses, killing invading cells. But the, the other important thing that these antigen-presenting T cells do is go to the lymph node. In the lymph node, there are primordial B cells, and this antigen on a T cell is presented to a B cell, that's T and that's the B, and the, the B cell has an analogous system for generating antibodies, just like the T cell receptor, you got lots of different more or less random combinations that allow, allow individual cells to recognize individual antigens, a, a, a parallel array of antibody genes that recombine the same way and give you now, when presented in the right context, the T cell, its T cell receptor and antigen recognized in a lymph node by a primordial B cell. That B cell, again, just like the T cell, starts to, starts to um, gets a signal to divide and increase its number. B cell does the same thing and eventually matures to what we call a plasma cell, which is the antibody producing cells, and will spit out the several classes of, of antibodies that we recognize. So the hallmarks of this, why, what, what, what makes immunity? Immunity is the ability to recognize an antigen and to remember it so that the next time you see it, you have a, a much more rapid response than you would the first time you see it, okay? And obviously there's some development involved in humans and, and other, other uh, uh, mammals and, and uh, higher vertebrates with immune systems so that you gotta provide some protection in that early time. For us, that comes from maternal antibody that's transferred um, uh, both across the placenta as well as, uh, as, well as in breast milk. Okay, so a hallmark is of immunity is being able to recognize an antigen as foreign and responding in a in an unamnestic way with memory. Okay. Well, if we think about single cells, they have they have a problem that an evolutionary problem that humans and multicellular organisms don't. We can afford to have some B cells and T cells beat up and killed in the process, but if you're a bacterium, you know, for each cell, as a first approximation, n equals one, right? There's no way of passing on that information if, if the information if uh, if the cell is killed. And one of the major problems that a bacterium will have is bacteriophages, and bacteriophages are come in many flavors, um, but the way they operate, and they're called bacteriophages because they're, they're phage bacteria and they, they eat or live off bacteria. And there are huge numbers of these in the world, but we are just beginning to discover their diversity and trying to understand their host specificity. But by and large, what a virus is, pretty simple thing. A virus is a protein coat, a receptor for something residing on the cell surface of a bacterium, and nucleic acid. And you can have single-stranded RNA viruses, double-stranded RNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses, double-stranded DNA viruses, and they're, they're uh, classified largely according to that. For the single-stranded viruses, they're also classified as whether they're positive strand or negative strand. We'll get to that in a minute. If you look at the genomes of bacteriophages, they're pretty simple and relatively small. And basically, they, um, they encode a polymerase. So reverse transcriptase that we use for transcribing DNA into RNA 
is uh, a retroviral protein, a ret uh, retroviral protein first discovered by, um, by David Baltimore and others that's responsible for taking a single stranded RNA and turning it into a DNA copy that the host cell can, is forced to recognize and turn into lots of new copies of the virus. So we'll get to the rest of the genome here in a minute and we'll sort of walk our way through this. So bacteriophage binds to the surface of cell, extrudes its DNA or RNA or whatever into host cell. Um, often will have a polymerase that either just makes a second copy, so you've got functional DNA, or first makes a, a DNA copy from the RNA. Uh, generally, you want a double-stranded DNA structure. And then the host's own cellular machinery is turned against it to make the viral pro the other viral proteins that's needed to make the complete virus. The last of these proteins are the structural proteins that are responsible for housing the, the nucleic acid and making the virus. You can get thousands and thousands of copies of a virus in the in a cell. And eventually what happens is the cell breaks and out these bacteriophage go. Okay? Bacteriophage, so relatively small genome, talking, you know, 10 kb-ish for, for many of them. Uh, some smaller, some larger. Uh, host strain specificity that we don't really understand because we don't really understand all of the the diversity of these viruses, but generally the interaction between a bacteriophage and a particular bacterium is driven by the specificity of the, the leading edge of this bacteriophage and cell surface molecules that are on that bacterium. So there is a, there is a, host, um, a host specificity, it's not a random, it's not a random. Bacteriophage are important in the world for a couple of, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is a, uh, an economic one. Many of the biological compounds that we use, whether it's monosodium glutamate um, or whether it's wastewater treatment plants, uh, there are important biological processes that we depend on being carried out by bacteria, whether it's in a 500 liter fermenter down at Bayer making, making some uh, anti-cancer drug, or if it, it's removal of phosphate from wastewater treatment down, in, in, uh, down at the end of this, uh, the, the, the uh, little canal that runs by the KGI. Um, and bacteriophage can infect these industrial processes and completely shut them down. And it happens sort of out of the blue. It's not known what the bacteriophage is for most of these processes and can be, is a huge economic problem for uh, companies. Uh, what do you mean like by shutting down the process? What happens is exactly this. So you'll have a fermenter that's making cancer drug of choice, right? You got a 500 liter fermenter. Yeah. And you're giving it the chemicals it needs. You've got the bugs in there to make to make the the chemical of interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, that big fermenter gets contaminated with one of these viruses. It will kill all those bacteria, and you are all of a sudden not. <laughs> this guy is very strange. Keep an eye on him. <laughs> I will can kill all the bacteria in that fermenter, and batch batch done. Right, mm. and because you don't know what the bacteriophage is, you, you got to start your culture over, and you you know it's in it's in the house now. These things are resistant often to drying, uh, so getting rid of them is not necessarily an easy thing. 
So you cannot uh, get rid of them because of the antivirus or something, right? I mean. Uh, uh yeah, we have no, we have no antibiotics. No antibiotics for, antibiotics for, for, for the vast majority of, 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 okay. of viruses. Okay. So, and the second increasingly apparent role for bacteriophage is as a reservoir of um, additional genetic diversity. Penny Chisholm at, at uh, MIT has talked about this at a, our user meeting a couple of times. Her system is, the bacteria she's interested in is Prochlorococcus, which is a, a, uh, a cyanobacterium, so it fixes carbon, hugely abundant in the, in the ocean, responsible for, you know, pick a number, some large fraction, 20 to 50 percent of the carbon captured in the ocean is captured by, by Prochlorococcus. And Prochlorococcus has a series of bacteriophage, and one of the things that in the process of, of uh, infecting and lysing cells, bacteriophage can sometimes pick up bacterial, bacterial genes. And then when they infect another cell, that bacterial gene can be, can be horizontally transferred to the next, to the, another cell. So, they provide both a, a, a mechanism for transferring bacterial genes from one, from one bacterium to another, but they also, Penny believes, provide a reservoir for genes that are gonna be lost from, uh, are gonna, maybe lost from Prochlorococcus, because they don't need it right now. But it still exists in this reservoir, and because there's so many billions of these of these cells, it still exists in the in the environment. It could actually be later recaptured um, uh, and brought back into the brought back into the the bacterial pool through horizontal gene transfer. And there's there's just so much. Penny's argument is there's just so much viral biomass that um, it it's enough to provide a reservoir for lots of genes that may not exist in the, in the, in the currently thriving populations uh, for chlorococcus. But when you get some event, whether it's weather related, whether it's an algal bloom, whatever, however the, that particular piece of ocean might be, might be perturbed, you have this large reservoir of, of viral, uh, viral DNA. Can that be true for uh, eukaryotes too? Hmm? Mammals? Can it be true in human? The, you'd have to do the math, but the, the really striking thing is the huge amount of, of viral DNA there is in the ocean, and we just don't know it in, in humans. And because the generation time is relatively slow, um, to bring you know to bring a gene back into the, into the pool, way easier in bacteria than it's going to be in, in any complex in any complex system. Okay, so actually let's leave it right there. So, of course, if bacteriophage were were unrestrained, right? They they'd win this battle, right? But they don't. They are in balance with their with their hosts most of the time. And that's because the host fights back. Okay? And how does the host fight back? The restriction enzyme system, right? We've talked about this, I think, before, but let's talk about it quickly again. This is the bacterial chromosome, um, which is actually large, spread out, and largely attached to the in inside uh, cell membrane. We'll represent it as a circle for all intents and purposes, and it is circular. And what most bacteria do is have a system that recognizes foreign nucleic acid, whether it be single-stranded or double-stranded. Let's just take a double-stranded example. Uh, and what they do is recognize certain sequences in a very specific way, and the sequences are usually palindromic. Something like this. Okay. This 
is the this is the one of the prototypic enzymes, ECOR1. It's named because it comes from E. coli. That's what the ECO is for, R1, because it was the first restriction enzyme found in, in E. coli. So this is the ECOR1 recognition site, and if this is an E. coli that's making ECOR1, it would pr it produces these enzymes at baseline, and when it sees those cognate sequences, it cuts the DNA. It cuts it in a very quite reproducible pattern. I think for this one it cuts here and here. Um, and this, of course, is hugely important for, um, for recombinant DNA technology, right? This allows you to take pieces of DNA, cut them apart, and put them back together again. Okay, because when you split this apart, you have two halves that come back together. And anything that's been split apart with this enzyme, you could then join back together. Not necessarily in the right order, but it allowed, this was, this was, is the, in addition to cloning vectors, was the pivotal uh, uh, technology that launched the recombinant DNA technology field. Okay? So restriction enzymes, of course, are encoded um, on the bacterial chromosome and transcribed gives you the enzyme, cuts up, cuts up the viral DNA. Okay, what's missing here? Well, I have a question. So, how do they protect their own DNA? Exactly. Okay, you got to protect your own DNA, yeah. otherwise. You haven't. You kill yourself, right? And you kill yourself even when there's not any bacteria, any uh, viral DNA around. So you have to protect yourself. And the way that's done is with another set of enzymes called, in this case, would be E. coli one methylase. And what it does is methylate usually on both strands, but not always um, sequences that then prevent protect, prevent degradation by the, by the restriction enzyme. Why doesn't the phage do the same thing? Um, it would have to capture this, right? Not so easily done. But they, they copy themselves so many times, it should happen. And they become hugely yeah, successful sure if they do. Are, I'm sure there are examples of it. And the, one of the things that prevents that is that most bacteria, and we've been looking at this fairly intensively because we can detect these modifications now with a pack bio instrument, hmm. um, you don't just have one. You have at least several and sometimes many restriction enzymes. So this this uh, phage would have to capture not one, but five or six. And because the bacterial genome, ha uh, one of its, one of the features of this, the packaging of bacterial nucleic acid into the virus is it has to be a very specific size. So, and, the, and bacterial genes are stacked um, not just end to end, but they actually frequently overlap on opposite strands because replication is the name of the game for the bacteriophage. So having a compact genome is really, really important. So you can't, there's just not a whole lot of real estate to add things in. There probably is an arms race between them though. Yeah, absolutely so there is an arms race. Yeah. In terms of how many methylation sites you have. Yeah. Yeah, one of the most interesting things we've seen, um, uh, Eddie and, and Nikos' group have, been, have gotten interested in alternate genetic codes. Right? Not, not all bacteria use um, the same, the same uh, genetic code. And they've identified a previously undescribed uh, genetic code that occurs in a virus, and that that virus has 
recoded its, so it's using a different, it's gotten rid of one of its stop codons and uses one of its stop codons as an amino acid, um, uh, as an amino acid coding region. And of course, the only reason it, it must, if that's what it's done, right, it's done that, the niche that it now occupies having done that, is that it can infect a host that uses that alternate genetic code. We haven't found the host, but we know that must be what's happening because it, if it infected some host that had a standard genetic code, it wouldn't, it couldn't encode its proteins, right? So now the search is on to try and find the host for this, for this virus that um, we found several examples of in the in the broad, by surveying all of the metagenomic data for for something that looked like it had been recoded. You know, so interesting, interesting story. But it's absolutely this your move, my move sort of game. And that brings us to the next to the next step here. So we've got restriction enzymes chew up bacterial DNA, or I'm sorry, viral DNA, uh, methylases that prevent degradation of host DNA, all kinds of flavors of these, really important um, uh, industrial applications so that now you can, you know, one of the one of the things that postdocs used to do in the early recombinant DNA uh, years was trying to find the right combination of enzymes that cut sequences that you actually had, because you couldn't really change them, how to stitch things back together again in a way that everything works. Now you can find a restriction enzyme that, that recognizes just about any sequence you want. Uh, so having huge numbers of these turns out to be technically really important for the, for the recombinant DNA world. But that's not where the story ends. Remember, we were talking about immunity, and there's nothing, this is host defense, but that's not immunity, right? The hallmark of immunity is memory. There ain't no memory here. Um, and I remember <clears throat> some years ago when we were, you know, there were probably several dozen genomes have been sequenced. Um, Phil Hugenholtz, uh, who some of you may remember, a microbiologist was working here, was looking through the genome of something that we had, we had sequenced. And he came across some sequences that he didn't understand. And they look like this. So you have regular, here's a stretch of bacterial genome. And so he had, you know, regular bacterial genes, didn't know, didn't know what they were, but they looked like well-behaved bacterial genes. And then he found these things that had this funny structure. And the structure was unknown DNA followed by very short sequence followed by unknown DNA, followed by a very short sequence. Huge arrays of these things. And the really interesting thing that got Phil's attention and that of many others was that these short sequences interspersed in here had particular sorts of sequences. I think they may be eight. They vary a little bit, so we'll, we'll make it eight. Okay? And it's the same. Here, here, here. Okay? Hmm. Hmm. So, this is interesting. Makes you think a little bit about these palindromic sequences, like maybe you're going to cut these things up. And so these things got a name called CRISPRs. Uh, and these are called spacers. And these are short palindromic repeats. That's what the SPR is. And the C and R, I can't remember exactly. Um, 
And so when Phil looked at this thing, he did what anybody in JGI would do, had no idea what it was, he went and asked Natalia. And Natalia said, those are CRISPRs. So what's a CRISPR? Nobody knows what CRISPRs are, but they're pretty common. Well, now we have an idea about what CRISPRs are, and they are a bacterial immune system. Okay? Remember, EcoR1 is going to cut this thing up, this bacterial DNA up, into fragments. Right? Well, those fragments can be captured. And the reason we didn't know what these things were is we didn't have enough sequence to be able to recognize them. Once people got enough sequences from a variety of different places to start to recognize them, it became clear that what these things were um, were um, bacteriophage DNA. Bacteriophage lambda is the, is the prototypic bacteriophage that infects E. coli. Okay? And so what the cell was doing is capturing these viral sequences and arraying them in this interesting arrangement with palindromic sequences that suggest that maybe they're going to get cut up. Right? And then that was enough for smart people uh, to start to figure out what, what's actually going on here. And what we now know is um, that the CRISPRs are a key element in, in a bacterial immune system, and the, the critical linchpin of this is um, an enzyme called Cas9 that is receiving a lot of attention at the moment. Um, so the way this works, and I'll probably butcher this, um, but this thing is transcribed as a gene. It doesn't can't encode protein because it's got this funky, this funky uh, arrangement. But you get a, you get an RNA driven off of this thing, this single stranded like bacterial and, and eukaryotic RNAs are. And there is also transcribed a complementary. That's what the C is for. Complementary. Sequences to this that come from elsewhere that end up hybridizing this single stranded RNA and making double stranded RNA. Cas9 comes along um, and cuts these things. Okay, it's got a little recognition system for, for Cas9. So Cas9 now has cut these things into sequence specific. Bacteriophage invades, which is linear single stranded RNA. This can come over and form double stranded RNA. The size of these things is quite um, precisely uh, managed. That's going to be important later. But they're, they're long enough to 
to be quite specific. That's really the key, right? If you if you had a six base sequence, so that's not going to do, right? Because that's uh, then you're back in the restriction enzyme problem. You need a long enough sequence that it's going to be unique. Okay. So now you've got double stranded RNA, um, and it turns out that um, what happens. When, when these things bind to double-stranded DNA, it forms a loop. Now, how can they do that? How is it that an RNA can wheedle its way in and force apart that DNA? Well, it turns out that DNA RNA hybrids are more stable than DNA DNA hybrids. And RNA RNA hybrids are even more stable than RNA DNA hybrids. So there's normally some breathing. It's, you know, it's chemistry. It's, it's equilibrium. There's normally some breathing of, of um, uh, double-stranded DNA, and these RNA molecules are more stable, so they end up forming these loops. And these loops are then recognized by Cas9, and Cas9 cuts here, and it cuts here. And in bacteria, when you get a double-stranded break, it usually leads to degradation of the DNA. Okay? So, the, I don't know, frankly, what's known about the, the upstream conversion of viral sequences into, this, into these arrays. I'm not sure that that's actually known. But there's been a lot of interest on this downstream because you've now got a system for recognizing in a sequence specific fashion the recognizing and degrading DNA in a sequence specific fashion and to those who think about such things 24 hours a day that's an engineering system for changing DNA sequences you've got the substrates right you've got sequence specificity and, and, and a highly versatile enzyme that seems to be able to work on RNA, DNA, um, and um, with very precise uh, and, and predictable uh, requirements. Okay? Well, why do we care about all this? Why would we want, we got engineering systems. We've been engineering DNA for years and years and years and years. Well, one of the problems is we like to, bacterial engineering we can do reasonably well. But if you want to do as, as Eddie and Sarah Richardson and Chen Fong Cheng want to do, you want to modify every stop codon in an organism to make it so that bacteriophage can infect it. You got 408 of them to change. And that means doing something iteratively over and over and over again. And since our processes aren't perfect or fast, that's really laborious. So it's been done. George Church's group has knocked out all the stop codons in an individual organism, done all that engineering, but it took about six years. And God knows how many, you know, poor graduate students and postdocs uh, who spent their life on it for a while. So we need a, we, there's room for a better system. But even more so, we'd like to engineer complex organisms, not just bacteria. And so, well, can't we do that already, right? How many hundred gene knockouts, thousands of gene knockouts have been made? Lots. But making a gene knockout is really complicated, right? Yet what do you do? You take the gene of interest, here's the gene of interest, and it's, right, it's split up into its many exons, and we're going to replace, you know, two exons with, you know, some reporter gene. And you have to, you have to create this construct. Um, it's big. Targeting vectors are often 
10,000 base pairs or longer. So they're big enough that they're not easy to synthesize. Um, although that's getting a little easier. You have to have both a, a positive and a, and a negative selectable, selectable marker on this thing. You put this thing on a plasmid. You inject that into a mouse ES cell. And then you do your positive and negative selection. And if you're lucky, if you're lucky, you get, you know, two to five percent, five percent if you're really lucky, will actually target in the right place and do the right thing. And then you take that mouse yes cell and you make a and you make a, a mouse out of it. My cells look like slugs. Um, and this again, because it's got to end up in the germline as a 50-50 proposition. Right? So you want to modify these cells just to knock it out, just to do standard reverse genetics. I want to get rid of the gene and see what happens. Okay. Just to do that is, a, is still a big deal. And doing it in high throughput is still really hard. Right? Well, but what you like to do is test individual mutations, right? You've got human patients, you find mutations associated with a disease in that patient or their family. You haven't proven anything. You've proven an, you've proven an association, right? You haven't proven causation. To prove causation, you'd like to look specifically at what an individual mutation does. But to do that requires going through this whole rigmarole plus removing any sequences that you may have introduced, right, because they may cause problems, you'd like to, in a much more surgical way, be able to target this thing into double-stranded DNA and make very specific changes, okay? Well, this starts to look a little bit promising in that respect. And so, the question then, can you use Cas9 and similar? There are actually a number of different Cas9s. There are many hundreds now known. We don't know what, how most of them work, but they're in three general classes um, called Cas1, called class 1, class 2, and class 3, or type 1, type 2, and type 3. The, the type 2s have a Cas9 that is the most versatile. And basically what, if we look at this system, um, these things have a tail that Cas9 and another RNA that binds to it, I think related to these spacers, and that becomes, the, and that hooks onto the Cas9 enzyme. Cas9 enzyme then cuts both strands. What they have now engineered, so here's host DNA, it's looped. People have engineered engineered RNAs that loop back on themselves that provide the, the Cas9 recognition. So you can you can engineer this thing to be transcribed as a single RNA so that it wheedles itself into the DNA, assumes the correct structure, and now all you need to do is have Cas9 come in. It cuts here and here, but we have mechanisms for for repairing DNA. Okay? But when Cas9 cuts, it also has been engineered to have an exonuclease in it that removes a base or two. So when this thing gets repaired, it's now introduced a frame shifting mutation into this gene. So now to target any gene, all you, you're, all you need to do is put in a plasmid that expresses Cas9, 
and expresses a guide RNA of 40 nucleotides, plenty long enough to be highly specific for any gene you want in, uh, in the human genome. And because you can do this on a plasmid, you can put it into an ES cell or in any other cell type for that matter, it doesn't even have to be an ES cell. You get expression of Cas9, you get expression of the guide, the guide RNA, it does its job, you let the plasmid get spit out, as plasmids will inevitably do, and you've now modified this cell. Okay. Well, sounds great. Does it work? Yeah, baby. <laughs> so when you do this to a mammalian cell line that we couldn't, we can get DNA into it, but we have no way of, of really modifying it. You can only modify things like ES cells, these really primitive cells, where that's where the recombination will occur. You can get 50% of cells to be modified using Cas9, 50% of human cells, 50% of zebrafish cells, 50% of frog cells, much higher fraction of bacteria. It looks like a system that can be optimized to operate in virtually any cell type. Okay. And again, because its requirements are so limited, a plasmid with a selectable marker so that you can get it in, so that you, once you put it into a cell, you can identify the cells that have taken it up. A relatively short sequence that's long enough to be highly specific, and an enzyme that seems to work in all these different environments. And that's really been the holy grail of something that's simple enough uh, and active enough that it um, can speed up processes that, that may need to be iterated. If you knew you could afford to do 400 independent modifications, if you knew you could do one a day, right, then it takes you a year, way better than five years. Um, allows you to make much more specific modifications. And there are, there are ways of engineering this guide RNA in such a way that you can actually introduce mutations uh, into, into the, uh, sorry, not just introduce mutations, but introduce changes. You want to change an amino acid from one thing to another thing. You want an uncertainty basis as opposed to a whole codon. So you could sequence a cancer, uh, cancer cell, and 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 attack it by this, and uh, basically yeah. destroy. Yeah, I mean where you do or it. Or degrade half of the. Where you do it probably is not in the cancer cell, since once cancer cells get going, they they accumulate all kinds of different mutations. But can't you break you them? The stem cell, can't you right? stop them from? Yeah, you from dividing. The, the, the mutations and you correct them, right? <laughs> Do that, in it, do that in a pre-fertilized embryo. I mean, the, the kinds of things that become possible uh, in terms of gene therapy, you know, I mean, clearly there are ways to go before we start doing that. You know, but the ability to much more incisively and reproducibly and effectively modify DNA is going to be hugely important both for human human therapy as well as just the general class of engineering problems. Because now you can do pretty much, we'll be soon able to do pretty much anything we want in any animal's world. As long as, and now the hurdle will be, can I get the DNA in? Right. So you'll be hearing way, way, way more about Cas9 in the, in the months and years ahead. But it seems like it's Thank you.